I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin Podcast. I'm Spencer. I'm John. We're here with episode 62 coming at you. All kinds of good stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about Wes Craven today. Yeah, in honor of his film My Soul to Take, which opens this Friday. Yes, and then we're going to be talking about horror films that were unfortunately cut down. Yeah, by the MPAA in yeah. honor of Hatchet 2's unrated release in AMC theaters. If you haven't figured it out yet, this is all part of the MacGuffin Horror October. That's right. This is the first week of October and the first, first official. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And the first week of our October Horror Film Fest. Yeah. Uh, what's going to be happening is every week in October, we're going to be talking horror movies. Yeah. Every topic will be horror movies, except for maybe DVD picks then we can talk about yeah. other stuff <laughs> so after after talking about the mpa and all that business we're gonna be giving you those dvd picks as always and uh, you, can, at, you can check out more information about us and our articles and whatnot at mcguffinpodcast.com and overabundance of information yeah. there is almost too much information on this yeah. website look Good at stuff. some of it you know help us check it get out. through it <laughs> but if that isn't enough a if reminder that, if that's not enough mcguffin for you yeah. as we mentioned last week we will be hosting a special screening it's a double feature of big trouble in little china one of john carpenter's best movies yep. and night of the creeps one of the most underrated horror movies of the 80s at the grand illusion cinema on friday october 22nd at 7 p.m is when this double feature starts spencer and i will be introducing the films we'll be holding trivia there's going to be food there's, there's giveaways going to be prizes yeah it's going to be awesome you should it's be going there to be so special much fun. video clips mm -hmm. so go to grandillusioncinema.org to get the lowdown on the location of the theater ticket prices all that stuff and we will see you at 7 p.m on october 22nd be there This Friday, October 8th, is the new film from Wes Craven. Definitely one of the masters of horror, although funnily enough, he did not direct an episode of that TV show. Yes. Um, My Soul to Take. Mm -hmm, his first 3D film, which we'll get into how we feel about that a little bit later. Hey. Uh, but what we're going to do is look back on his career. Definitely a varied career. He's been going strong since 75, but has it always been, you know, black roses and good horror times? We'll see. Actually, even before that, 72. Last House on the Left. Well, you proved me wrong, yeah. sir. I thought that so, was a 75 we'll, movie. <laughs> we'll, we'll start right there. Last House on, Last House on the Left. Mm -hmm. His first film. They directed, edited, wrote. I mean, yep. as if he's not, like, multi-talented enough. <laughs> like, let's throw some other jobs in there. Um, you know, classic film. That's sort of like a tradition in uh, Wes Craven is that he has these great ideas, mm -hmm. executes them very well classic master of horror that that's mm. true but I, one thing though with this first movie about last house on the left very controversial movie i would say it is definitely well regarded within the horror community i am not the biggest fan of it it is a very hard movie to watch oh, I being agree. it's the whole you know rape, rape and revenge yeah. kind of movie you know um and it's just it's a brutal movie it is presented in like filmed on cheap 16 millimeter stock like it looks like a documentary i mean uh, obviously this is the film that inspired the remake that came out was it last year the a year few before? years ago yeah um i agree the rape and all that is very hard to watch this is sort of like the quintessential like revenge appreciation kind of film though like mm. by the end you're rooting for that family to like get revenge. to get revenge for the death I mean, of their daughter but one thing that's interesting is craven comes from an academic background he used to be a professor and so one thing that he does is it's not just about you know the gut reaction like maybe a death wish movie of like yeah get him he's really like looking at okay are the parents justified in doing this? Like, well, obviously, mean, they want retribution, oh, totally but agree. the brutality that they go to, is that any different than the and brutality I mean, I, the criminals went to? I, I think Which is, is, it's interesting that he even brings up those questions in a horror movie. I, I mean, I think this is something that we'll definitely discuss more and more as we go on. It's what... Because films are very philosophical things. Mm. I mean, we've spoken about Nightmare on Elm Street before yeah. and stuff. Like, he he definitely has this sort of baseline core, which you can take away and enjoy. But there's also a whole other level. Yeah, he puts on. some thought into it. Um, even pulling from real-life events and stuff for a lot yeah. of movies. And one thing we should mention with Last House on the Left, it's a loose adaptation of Ingmar Bergman's film The Virgin Spring. Which, I mean, what other horror debut has been yeah. taken from a classic of, you know, film? Totally, totally. <laughs> so, I mean, you know... So you follow that up, of course. I mean, five years later, yeah. follow up. But I mean, with uh, The Hills Have Eyes, another film remade. Mm -hmm. um, it has since become a horror classic. Yes. And I think it is a much stronger movie than the, the Last House on the Left. I am definitely a fan of The Hills Have Eyes. Yeah, The Hills is definitely better than the remake. I mm -hmm. mean, 
it, it, the Hills Have Eyes is one of those sort of films that um, kind of fits into that. Was it a Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind That's of thing? That's true. Also, it had the same production designer. Yes. So it was that same kind of vibe where it's like, you know, off the beaten path of society, you'll find, you know, suddenly it turns into like the Dark Ages. You didn't even realize that just that people like this could exist but in that's, the modern that's just world. It's sort of like it's, it's like these... I mean, the the remake made them just like basically mutants. Yeah. So like, but it gave them those sort of like creepy people out there, you know. Mm-hmm. And it definitely it gave showed them depth. It, no, it's true. It had a you know a normal family drives off and their RV breaks down and they are in the valley of this you know evil family. But it shows you you get to know the bad family and like the the bad seed the bad seed within their black sheep within the bad family quote unquote is the nice one. It's a girl who shows mm. compassion. They're like, yeah. oh, what's wrong with you? You know, who cares about them? We we need to kill them. And uh, and it's just it's very interesting. Once again, it was inspired by a classic story of I believe the Sonny Bean family who were a clan of cannibals that lived in like uh, some caves in Britain or something like that. I mean, it's, there's definitely parallels to be made with Texas Chainsaw Massacre with that sort mm-hmm. of family of killers and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, and mean, it's also just like that kind of gritty realism where it doesn't go as far as Last House on the Left, which I think makes it an overall more enjoyable film. And also I think the script was a little tighter. There's some really weird comedy relief or trying to be comedy relief in yeah. Last House on the Left with like Keystone Cop-esque scenes. <laughs> but yeah. uh, Hills Have Eyes, it just, it's intense. And I mean, it stays with you. It definitely does makes you want to not go on a vacation. But, I mean, again, <laughs> another wonderful idea. I mean, there's mm-hmm. there's very deep philosophical things going about. You know, like the the, the evil family and the good family mm-hmm. and sort of crossing paths. And stuff. Yeah, he's kind of he refined what he was kind of thinking about in Last House on the Left. I think those films very much go together. Mm-hmm. You can tell they're a part oh, of his totally. development. Um, and then he moved on to Deadly Blessing a few years later, mm-hmm. which. Still had those similar themes, but then he added the supernatural to it, and I think it was kind of a little too much. I'm not the biggest fan of Deadly Blessing. I think it's kind of just an okay movie. It mixes in kind of this Amish sort of clan led by Ernest Borgnine, uh, mm. who's not really the most threatening of guys. No. <laughs> but no. it mixes, like, you know, this sort of clan going about doing their own evil thing with a supernatural, like, succubus kind of entity, which there are some suspenseful moments. It uh, has a young Sharon Stone in it. Um, and it has some interesting twists to the plot near the end where you finally figure out what's going on. Unfortunately, Craven piles too much on, so much so that there's another twist, even after you think the movie's over then there's one of the most ridiculous twist endings like i would say right up there with high tension wow. <laughs> happens at the end of deadly blessing which sort of undermines the whole movie <laughs> um and this kind of you know set him sort of on a path of iffy projects for a few years because the first two were very successful in the exploitation drive-in yep. kind of circuit yep. but deadly blessing i don't think as much i mean then i guess he kind of went a little bit I don't, I don't know if mainstream is the term but swamp thing was sort of like you know one that i believe was based on someone else's property it was based on a comic book, yeah, and it was so one it was of the fa- first comic movies. Right, but I mean, again, this is sort of the first time he stepped away. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know Alan Moore has worked on Swamp yeah. Thing. A lot of famous authors have worked on it. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's the first time he sort of stepped away from writing and creating these worlds all by himself. Mm-hmm. Which is and one he of- also stepped away from horror. Yeah, and but it's, that's one of his best skills, is being able to craft this interesting mm. philosophical world. And so, I mean, sure, there's there's some stu- interesting stuff in Swamp Thing. Yeah, um, but overall, it's, 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 it's pretty just, cheesy. It's just not as creative. <laughs> it's just not as... Ex- yeah, and it tries to be like this, you know... Rip, rip roar and comic book action movie, but unfortunately they don't really have the budget. The action yeah, is very exciting. It, what, three the mo- million dollar budget. The monsters, like Swamp Thing, looks great, but the monsters besides Swamp no. Thing, no, not very good at all. Uh, one interesting thing about the history of Swamp Thing is that it was famously released on DVD in an uncut form, where you saw Adrian Barbo's Barbos, if you will, yeah. and uh, it was labeled as PG on the DVD. Wow. So you know, some mom rented Shocked, the DVD yeah. for her kids at Blockbuster, and then she's like, "What?" Are are those breasts? And suddenly it was recalled, and that DVD goes for a lot on the secondary market. If that's, you can find that original funny. Swamp it's Thing, it's hard to imagine like somebody like PG thirteen Swamp Thing. This looks like a nice family film. Yeah, especially yeah. in the eighties. You know, you can show stuff in PG movies in the eighties that you can't show nowadays. Um, so after that, I mean, is arguably his masterpiece with 
Nightmare on Elm Street. I yeah, mean. definitely his most successful movie up to that point, and I think his most indelible creation. Like Freddy yeah. Krueger will live on well I mean, past Wes Craven. I, I think we've spoken about it before that you know, in terms of like those long-standing horror franchises, I think Freddy Krueger is by far the most interesting of them. I mean, you know, I have appreciation for all of them. Yeah, but Freddy Krueger has such a wonderful sort of. Uh, persona to him he, he's, mm -hmm. he's sort of got the good and the bad all going well, on he's at like once. so vicious but he, just the way he enjoys it like even in, in the later sequels he kind of went into a stand-up comedian yeah, mode a little bit too bad. So but even in the original he's like you know he's threatening tina and then he cuts off his own fingers and just laughs as he bleeds but all I over mean, himself there, like it's messed up <laughs> there's also sort of that sort of um like uh, creation of like what created Freddy Krueger. What's mm -hmm. the backstory here? They left that nice and vague in the original. Yeah, like, and it just um, makes this nice world of the town of Elm Street with the you know the sins of the parents revisited upon yeah. the teens. And this is another thing based in reality. Like only someone you know with the brain in their head like Wes Craven would be able to read a story about um, a teen who is like a refugee from Korea or someplace mm -hmm. like that, and he had been telling his parents you know I can't go to sleep. I'm gonna die if I go to sleep. And they would find like coffee cups in his room like a coffee maker he would they'd give him sleeping pills they would spit him out and then one night he went to sleep and died and there was no they couldn't find any reason why he died in his sleep Wes Craven read this in the Los Angeles paper and was like I'm gonna make that a horror movie well, I mean, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a brilliant idea I mean mm -hmm. the idea of like if you die terrorized in your sleep, in yeah. your sleep like that I mean that's that sort of informed me to this day I remember being in a psychology class and being like so uh, what does it mean if you die in your sleep I mean obviously I didn't think you'd actually and they're die. like you're stupid no but it was, sort of, it was sort of like one of those things that actually made enough of an impression on me as hmm. a school student I was yeah. like yeah. so what exactly does this mean if you die in your dreams yeah like, do you go brain dead or what they took I mean, it in I Nightmare on Elm Street they make it uh, you know, very think, literal I'm I not saying think, that would yeah, happen but, but you know the questions yes. are there from Nightmare on Elm Street and that was a very popular movie movie uh, so popular that another movie that had been on the shelf for a while got released just based on the fact that they could say from the maker of Nightmare on Elm Street and that is The Unfortunate Hills Have Eyes Part 2 mm. easily Wes Craven's worst movie one of the worst movies I've ever seen yeah it was not good <laughs> it uh, you know brought characters back from the original that were dead for no reason it was filled with flashbacks to the original a good 45 minutes of the movie are flashbacks of the original and in one scene they give the dog a flashback uh, I mean you know, that's, it's, it's, the thing about you just think that it's probably not released for a reason. No, exactly. And it was in a slow period. He agreed to do it to get some money, probably to sustain himself. Well, not only that, but like <laughs> it just like a studio that had sitting around was like, oh, you know what? Gonna release that. He's a name brand now. We're exactly. Gonna make some money, make off, some of money off it. And then uh, after Nightmare on Elm Street, he kind of got into this interesting thing. I've read some theories on Craven that every other movie was a solid movie. So, like, you know, he did Nightmare on Elm Street and then he dropped it with Hills Have Eyes. And then some would say, or Hills Have Eyes too, and some would say he dropped it a little bit and kept going flip-flopping back and forth between the good and bad. His next movie after that was Deadly Friend, which is one that I know a lot of people aren't the biggest fan of. It's kind of an 80s version of Frankenstein. I think it's a fun movie. This kid, you know, falls in love with his next-door neighbor, played by Christy Swanson, and she has... Like Christy Swanson. Yeah, she has an abusive dad, and he actually kills her um, in a moment of rage. She wow. dies, and so this lovesick nerd breaks down his robot and inputs a computer chip into her head. You know, really far fetch but it's like that's the 80s version of frankenstein yeah. is a computer girl and she then gets revenge on all the people who wronged her or wrong him uh, i think it has one of the most hilarious deaths i've ever seen where she kills the mom the evil mom from the goonies like the mom of oh, the yeah, uh, the, the bandits fratellis. yeah the mom of the fratellis she throws a basketball at her and her head explodes it is hilarious obviously it's not high art but i think it's fun it's cheesy in 80s well, i mean that's one of the things you gotta appreciate about west craven as you see later on in his career is that he has a sense of humor about himself. That's, I mean, that's definitely true. If you like, listen to his commentaries, even on Last House on the Left, a very dark, serious movie, he is cracking jokes the whole time. Well, He's a I very mean, funny guy. I think you can remember um, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. He plays oh, himself yeah, directing, true. I think it was Scream, Scream 4 at that point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which was a joke at that point since we become reality. But anyway, okay, after Deadly Friend, we have The Serpent and the Rainbow. And that is one of the ones that was people were thinking, like, oh, oh this is a solid one. Really? You don't like Serpent in the Rainbow? I mean, it's okay. I've read a lot of people, that's one of their favorite Craven movies, and it's I like okay. it a lot. I mean, it's it's, it's okay. In, in terms of my, like, 
favorite Craven movies. There's a lot of ones above I think it. it might be like his most underrated as far as like solid but not one of the big, you know, nightmares or scream kind of things. It's very interesting that it, it's once again taken from a memoir that is supposedly a true story of this guy who was investigating the voodoo rituals in Haiti mm. um, where, you know, they have this powder that makes you appear dead but, and then when you come back people think you're a zombie, the natives, but in reality you're not. Right. And I think there are some horrifying scenes like Bill Pullman is a star. I think it's one of his best performances performances and he is you know getting affected by these drugs there's this horrifying scene where he's imagining he's in a coffin and it fills with blood and he drowns in the blood in the coffin <laughs> also they counteract that kind of fantastical horror with real horror of there's a scene where he gets his scrotum hammered with a yeah. nail and i mean oh my god like that's it's, awful it's unpleasant <laughs> but i mean I think I mean I'll be I'll be honest like I just don't like Bill Pullman as an actor <laughs> like that's part of it mm. I mean so that definitely But near it's definitely not a perfect movie at the end he kind of makes the voodoo priest into too much of a Freddy kind of character which is and, something that plagued him a little bit uh, in the late 80s trying to make like the big villain who has all these powers and stuff And I honestly kind of think that voodoo really hasn't been done well a lot of the time I think a Well lot I think that movie probably did it the best by presenting the quote unquote real voodoo yeah, I mean, maybe. It's just, it just, I feel like voodoo is one of those things that is just. Not... To you, it might be too ridiculous? No, I, th I, th I, I think I find it an interesting idea. I mean, mm. I love that kind of stuff on Unsolved Mysteries. But it's just, it just, it always comes off sort of cheesy. Like, they just mm. don't treat it sort of. Yeah. Uh, okay. Anyway. Also, around the same time, we have to mention he went back to the Elm Street series. He co wrote the screenplay of part three, mm -hmm. which is arguably the best of the sequels of mm -hmm. the, that series. Um,. It was rewritten by Frank Darabont and the director Chuck Russell, and uh, I think it made a really solid entry. And so yeah. I don't, I don't think it's you know any coincidence any, that the three best I mean, in that Nightmare series Craven was involved he in. He also was a producer on it, executive, mm. but nevertheless he had his involvement with mm -hmm. it. Um, and then as a director, he unfortunately went back to the negative end of the coin. I mean, depending on what you think of Serpent of the Rainbow with Shocker. I think it's, you know, not many people are going to argue in Shocker's favor. It's pretty, you know, blatant rip off of Nightmare on Elm Street. Like Craven yeah. was tr trying to like go back and create that franchise once again like that character mm -hmm. and you know Horace Pinker I think his name was just as no Freddy Krueger although he was played very menacingly by Mitch Pileggi of the X-Files fame like um, and Peter Berg the later director of Hancock and other bad movies uh, played the main character Peter Berg is a pretty good actor yeah like, he's I don't an interesting know. actor like in Fire in the Sky but I liked him he does a lot of bad films he does a few good ones but like mostly bad mm. so go back to acting peter bird is my, <laughs> my point but uh yeah shocker it's just you know instead of he was burned and then he goes in your dreams and this one he's electrocuted and he jumps into other people's bodies it's just kind of a rip off of the hidden mm. mixed with this rip off of nightmare on elm street nah. and trying to be funny it's like he wasn't even ripping off the scary freddy krueger he was ripping off the sequel freddy krueger that he yeah. supposedly hated <laughs> yeah i mean then what was it the people under the stairs was the which next? is another solid one i think mm. People Under the Stairs, uh, you know, for me, it's there with Serpent in the Rainbow for being underrated and a solid film. And this is like a dark version of kind of the suburbs or, you know, just Americana. Yeah, I, I do like that about it. Mm -hmm. um, very entertaining performances by a couple of Twin Peaks alums, Everett McGill and uh, I forget the actress's name, but they play this married couple who wants a perfect family so much so that they kidnap people and they lock them in their house, hence people under the stairs. They run around with shotguns and leather outfits. Like there's some crazy stuff yeah, going on in that movie. Stuff. Um, but it's also interesting in that the main character of that is, uh, you know, he's a young black kid who is kind of put down upon by these people who are shown, they're kind of the family, like they're effed up, but they're shown as being like the high rollers of the neighborhood mm -hmm. kind of thing. And they want to make changes in the neighborhood about, you know, where he lives and stuff like that. So it's kind of a social commentary. Yeah. In that, I mean, it's, it's again, got that sort of philosophical mm -hmm. idea. I mean, there's the, the baseline product. And then there's this other message that can be read between the lines, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after th nightmare. after that, yeah, I think, uh, you know, came back to the Nightmare on Elm Street series with New Nightmare. And I think that's his best movie since the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm a big fan of New Nightmare. I think it's one of the most, if Nightmare on Elm Street is one of the most original mm -hmm. ideas for a movie, the New Nightmare is up there in like the top 10 for most original new ideas. New I mean, 
granted, his career since this time is very patchy. very hit and miss. Yeah, but I'm a, but I'm I mean, a big New fan Nightmare was good. It was sort of like one of those sort of was it meta commentaries or whatever. But it was the first. Like since right. then, That's we've been kind of inundated with it. That's what I'm saying. Like it it it, it was sort of uh, pushing a new sort of idea at that point. And again, mm-hmm. again, he was ahead of the curve. Oh yeah, definitely a curve that he would kind of set later. If you look at New Nightmare and think about Scream, it's kind of you know saying a yeah. lot of the same thing. Scream just happened to be more popular and was more of an original thing instead of being the seventh right. Nightmare on yeah. Elm Street movie. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, in between those two high points came Vampire in Brooklyn. <laughs> Woo, I don't know what made him want to work with Eddie Murphy. I don't know what... <laughs> These horror directors, I mean, John Carpenter worked with Chevy Chase on Memoirs of Invisible Man, didn't work out well. Wes Craven with Eddie Murphy didn't work just, out well. It just seems like such a weird pairing that, like, yeah. even right from the, the trailers <laughs> looked bad, like... The the title is dumb. Yeah, like just nothing nothing <laughs> good about this. Like I don't want to see Eddie Murphy trying to be scary. I, you know, he I just, just <laughs> he was he's not he's not. I mean, he's, and it's this weird thing. Like sometimes it's a little bit trying to be scary, but for the most time it's just he's dressed up as different characters being silly. And yeah, I mean Eddie Murphy. I would say more often than not is not a good actor. Like occasionally he has good performances, yeah, but he he you're right. <laughs> he's too over the top most of the time, and like it just did not come together well. No, um, but then he Scream. you know he came back with Scream, which you know it's Massively either that or Nightmare successful. on Elm Street. If you're talking about his masterpiece for people, mm-hmm. and honestly, personally for me, Scream is my favorite Wes Craven movie. I I would say name I I love. I love the production of Scream. I love the idea of Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street is definitely a great idea. So, I think Scream has just a great cast, great characters. The script is so good. I mean, it's, like Kevin it's, Williamson's script like was a big deal for a reason. Unfortunately, he hasn't written anything close to as good since then. I mean, the the whole thing about it though is it's so polished. Like mm. the script is excellent. The yeah. acting is great. Getting people like Drew Barrymore. Yeah, to do like a Janet Lee kind like, of role. That stuff is like phenomenal. Like mm-hmm. everything, and the direction by Craven. Yeah, is everything very good. everything is polished. Like that is like a perfectly produced sort of product right mm-hmm. there. I mean, which I think, and a lot of people kind of poo-poo it for that. Like, oh, it's a big glossy product. Oh, it made it so we got a bunch of slasher ripoffs. And I mean, after that, it's, but it's, at the same time, you got to think before Scream. 90s horror was dead. Yeah. I mean, Batman Returns was on the cover of Fangoria, for God's sakes. That's how few horror movies there were. I mean, not only that, but like, it mean, it wasn't as like raw as a lot of horror films are. And I'm sure like hardcore horror fans didn't appreciate that. I mean, it was like a, a killer with a knife. You didn't really but see I a mean, lot of blood. I mean, the, for, to what came after it, it's probably the most intense of those ones right, as far as blood and gore. Right. But I mean, it, it, it was it wasn't hardcore. And I, I mean, I think that is unfortunately that people might take that perspective because mm. it, it's 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 got the shocks it's got the fun i mean it's got all these yeah, elements and it's of just it. a very smart idea having the characters being aware of the horror movies and stuff like that unfortunately yeah. it's something that was beaten into the ground much yeah. like the dream reality in nightmare on elm street was beaten in the ground over the course of the I 80s mean, it's prob- the scream factor was beaten into the ground over the course of it's the late 90s probably partly his fault in just sort of revisiting it yeah you know, <laughs> and like the jamie kennedy character really hammering home every part about like oh but it's, that's it's, really it's, clever i mean I think- it's, it's clever but like you know it sort of hammers home that sort of idea of Scream that people eventually got sort of like sick of when more and more mm. things started ripping it off. Yeah. Scream was sort of the lightning rod of what was going on there. Mm-hmm. And people were like, you know, freaking Scream, like talking about <laughs> all this film, oh, in a horror movie, blah, blah, blah. And it's sort of like, it's not Scream's fault that these things have been like beaten to death. Yeah, Scream but just happens definitely... to be the one that people think of immediately mm-hmm. when they're trying to think of something to rip on about this. Yeah, and then uh, a year later, he followed it up Scream with Scream 2. 2. I think not even, it might have been like 11 months for release date. It was so quick they rushed yeah. into Scream 2. I think Scream 2 is okay. It's got nothing on the original, but it's a pretty good movie. I mean, I think it's good. I mean, it's still a Jamie Kennedy in it, who I mm-hmm. like a lot as a character, and a lot of the originals coming back and stuff. It was, it was, this is sort of like like the the point at which Scream was still pretty enjoyable. Scream three dropped off a fair amount and got yeah. into a much more ridiculous <laughs> sort of point. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they sort of twisted again through a, a couple of different killers into it, is when it starts to push that envelope. Yeah, of what that's was... true. One thing that was so great about the original Scream was the reveals the reveal of the killer. You yeah. were like, oh, it made perfect sense. It was someone you suspected, but then it comes back around. You don't suspect yeah. him, but then oh, it's it was it's perfect. But then in Scream Two, it was just like wait, out of left field. It was like, really yeah. both of them. You're like, okay, one of them it could sort of make sense. The other one was like. 
like they didn't even really give a reason why this person well, I mean, was the they, killer. It, it felt like a stretch. was <laughs> like, oh yeah, I mean, this kind of references people in the original. So yeah. it, it, I mean, it, it, it was it was enjoyable, but kind of pushed the limits. That was still okay. Mm -hmm. Again, then after that, music of the heart. But I mean, that was something that Craven wanted to do for a long time. I think he was probably stuck in this horror thing. Like if you're successful in horror, that's all you're gonna get the money for. Yeah. So he came up with the you know Dimension Film slash Miramax talking with them like okay I'll do Scream 3 if you let me do something that isn't horror and that's what he did with Music of the Heart I have to say I never watched it I'm interested in seeing it just because it's yeah. Wes Craven but it does look like kind of generic it's feel good so, drama it's so generic it was that uh, Meryl Streep I believe yeah but um, I mean she has to be good as Meryl Streep I think Meryl Streep kind of phones it in. Really, huh? Yeah. I mean, I That's feel like bad. it's one of those ones that, as you said, is very generic. I mean, it's okay, but like, I feel like it would have been better off for everyone if the series had just been like, we won't let you make Then He was like, no, I don't want to make Scream 3. <laughs> just avoid those two films altogether. Just skip right along and move on. You know? Yeah, because then we had uh, Scream 3 in 2000, and one big negative impact on Scream 3 was Columbine. Yeah. Every horror movie after April 1999 was afraid of showing blood, afraid of showing extreme violence. So much so that in Scream, you Scream 3, you have a character get his throat slit and then no blood comes out. He's like, yeah. oh, 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 yeah, and then he fine. falls. And it's like, I mean, shoot it differently. I understand you're trying to be sensitive, but it is a horror movie. It yeah. is a slasher movie. How sensitive do you have to be in a movie where the whole point is that people are going to die? But and I mean, also just, it wasn't as solid of a movie yeah. at all. <laughs> but it was a long time after that, another like five years before his next film, Cursed, came out. And that was bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Cursed was bad. It suffered a lot of behind-the-scenes struggles with reshoots happening. Uh, people like Corey Feldman and some other others were in the film, and then the Weinstein Company demanded reshoots, or maybe it was Dimension at that time, demanded reshoots. So whole subplots were taken out. Mandy Moore was in the movie at one time. She was taken out. Yeah. Um, and it was supposed to be like a return to form, because Kevin Williamson wrote the script once again, like in Scream, Wes Craven directing it. They were like, this is the werewolf version of Scream. And so I was there opening day. I was like, mm -hmm. werewolves? Scream? Yes. <laughs> Like the screen people, and it's so bad. It's honestly one of his worst movies. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's not as creative as the previous ones. Yeah, I mean, it tries like by doing the references to real life, like they go on to real late night talk shows, and it's just at one point in the script, honestly, I think Scott Bayo is gonna end up being the killer. But as Scott Bayo, it's like what? Yeah, it, was, it just it was, makes it's just it's not it's not as. <laughs> Interesting as the other ones, but no, know. but that same year he had something different in Red Eye, which I thought was a solid movie. Instead mm -hmm. of doing the horror, he went it's more just like the suspense thriller yeah. route. Um, and I, I mean, thought it was good. good. Rachel McAdams, Killian Murphy. Yeah, um, it kind of felt like Collateral Junior, and that Collateral was in the cab for most of the time with the contract killer. Then at the end, they go to a different location, much like in Red yeah, Eye, on the plane was, with the killer for most of the time. This was much more of sort of like, um. I guess Clara was the more gritty version of That's it. true. And we should say Red Eye was PG-13, correct? Uh, I don't know. And so it was, you know... I believe it. It was more trying to appeal to a big audience, show that Craven but didn't need all the gore you gotta, and stuff. you got to appreciate a dude getting stabbed with a Frankenstein pen in, in the, the neck. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was good. But then, I mean, it was another long period before, basically, I think now... Well, he worked on a couple of scripts of a few projects, and he produced a few things. Uh, yeah. He worked on the script Paris for Jutin. Pulse, um, which he was going to direct at one time, but that fell apart, yeah. probably for the best, because that mm -hmm. was an awful movie. And then he produced Last House on the Left remake and the Hills Have Eyes remake. He was I mean, very he's involved in the remakes of his yes, movies. He's produced a lot of stuff. And he wrote the sequel to the Hills Have Eyes remake, which that's wasn't a remake yeah. of his original no, Hills Have Eyes well, 2. Well, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Isn't it? Like, if but I, I mean, the new if, Hills if, Have Eyes 2 wasn't any better. Well, well maybe uh, it was a little I think, bit better. Yeah, I, think was, I think it was better. So that was good. But now, I mean, his first the first one he's really directed mm -hmm. since in then. In five years. Which is My Soul to Take. And this is also the first one that he's written since New Nightmare. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like, this is a, the first solid 100% Wes Craven movie since New Nightmare. And I'm interested in it. I like the fact that it's an original idea. What it is, is this town had a serial killer. And on the night he was killed, I think like seven kids seven were born. Yeah, something like that. And now they're teenagers and someone's killing them off. Is it the killer reincarnated as one of them? Is it a copycat? Is one of them doing it? You know? I mean, it's, it's an intriguing thing. It's sort of like, is it... Uh, scream meets a nightmare on 
Elm, Elm Street. Street, sort of, yeah, so, exactly. I mean, with the like, past on the future, you know, like, influencing the future. I like those two things, and together that could be interesting. Or the flip side is it could just be. It could be bad. Yeah. And could, something that might lead to that badness is the fact that it's in 3D and yeah, it's post conversion I mean, 3D, I, which is the worst. I, I think there's no question that neither of us really embrace the 3D phenomenon. So it's just clearly <laughs> going it's for the It's a cash grab. Yeah. I mean, I read an interview with Craven in the newest Horror Hound where he says, like, he wanted to do stuff like with depth and how you show a shot it's not about like stuff flying at the camera so once you know so maybe he's doing something interesting with 3d who knows um but i think it'll be yeah. an interesting movie i'll definitely I mean, go it's check po- it out it's post-conversion 3d I, I just really don't think it could be anything great mm. interesting with 3d so i mean hopefully hopefully the story is interesting that's what yeah. i'm really banking on at this point so we like you west craven and i guess before we end we should note that scream, scream 4, 4 is coming out i mean uh which i don't know how to feel about that i'm excited because I, mean, I like the original, and they're saying, like, oh, it's going to be a throwback to more of the original style, not the sequels as much. But then the last thing Kevin Williamson wrote was Cursed, and he's writing this one. But the, the, the thing <laughs> is, I'm not sure... The fact that it's been ten years since Part 3. That's not even the problem. The problem is, like, is it a new group, or is it an old group? It's a mix of the new and old. Like, they say it's Part 4, but it's also the start of a new trilogy. I mean, because you've got hearing. David Arquette, Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox. Then you got people like Hayden Pintieri, Rory Culkin, Emma Marley Shellen, Mary McDonald... Mm-hmm. Anna Paquin and uh, Kristen Bell, but I think mm-hmm. those two are just cameos. So I don't know what to expect. Hopefully, it's more like the original Scream. Unless... Even hopefully, it's more like Part Two than Part Three. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, I mean, no I'm more not... exploding houses, please. I'm, I'm just not. I'm not <laughs> particularly excited about it. But I'm hoping my soul to take out of those two will be the more interesting of them. That's true. One thing about Scream Four, at least it's a sequel and not a remake. I'll always say that. Yeah. I would rather see a bad remake or a bad sequel than a remake. <laughs> yeah, agreed. So that's that's Wes Craven in that show. Mm-hmm. Let us know what you think about Wes Craven, uh, MacGuffinPodcast.com. Were we right about what we thought of his films? Were there ones that we unfairly praised or criticized? Yeah. We'd well, like, we like to know where mm-hmm. everyone comes down Wes Craven because he's a little bit more controversial as to what people think of him. That's true. You know, some people are just like, Wes Craven, and then other people are like, yes, everything great. So it's very interesting that he has so many classics within the horror genre but yet he can people are so split on his career so yeah let us know what you think we got from so right now in limited release is hatchet 2 uh, a sequel to a slasher movie from a few years ago that you know we weren't the biggest fans of it was maybe a little too jokey it advertised itself as old school american horror but it really had more in common i felt with some scream clones than it did with something like yeah. friday the 13th um but the sequel from what i've heard it's bigger and it's better and it's coming out unrated in a big theater chain. Which AMC is, Theaters is releasing it unrated. I mean, and when when we say it's it's getting a wide release, I mean it's getting released by a, a, a nationwide group. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, it's not going to probably be in every theater, so don't expect to see yeah. Hatchet Two everywhere you're going. But <laughs> it'll be in the big cities. It's, it's yeah. pretty it's pretty unusual for a film like this to get a un, unrated, unrated release, release widespread. In, exactly. And so we thought we'd look back on uh, maybe some movies that suffered a bit at the MPA's hands. Maybe it would have been good if they were able to be released unrated at the time. And one big period where the MPA was just like throwing when that hatchet down onto the film was the 80s they were not a fan of the whole slasher craze you know the first few friday the 13th came through and were popular and they were like wait a second these are awful these are immoral Mm -hmm. you know they kind of got up on their high horse and every horror movie suffered some cuts uh one of the first big ones was my bloody valentine the original which came out in 81 that movie, every death scene was cut down, sometime to the point of incoherence. There's a scene where characters are climbing up a ladder in a mine shaft, a body comes down and it's been hung, and as it hits the end of the rope, the body snaps off and the head's hanging there. When you watch the original version, they're climbing up a ladder. Something comes down, they scream, something falls, like you have no idea what's happened. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes it almost uh, not understandable, as you say, and mm-hmm. it's, it's sort of like, it's sad, because that's what horror people want. So if, yeah. if you don't give them the experience, they can't really truly appreciate the film as it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And another movie that was really cut down that ties into that is Friday the 13th Part 7. And the director of that movie, John Carl Beekler, described uh, you know stock and slash scenes like telling a joke. In a joke, there's a setup, and then there's a punchline. In horror movies, the stock scene, that's a setup. The punchline is the gory payoff. Yeah. And so in Friday the 13th Part 7, or the original My Bloody Valentine, the payoffs of these jokes 
jokes were neutered so much so you get all this set up and then nothing. Like in Friday the 13th 7, so much stuff was cut out like, uh, you know, Terry Kaiser from Weekend at Bernie's gets a uh, weed whacker to his stomach. All that happens is you see the weed whacker goes down and it goes like it barely touches his shirt and then you see his face go, uh, 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 uh. Yeah. and that, like that's it. And unfortunately that movie is like the holy grail for horror fans, <laughs> finding that unrated. It hasn't been released. On the DVDs you can see the uncut footage, but it's only like in a split screen with the original footage or with commentary, um, not in intercut back in the movie luckily the original my bloody valentine you can now watch on dvd unrated well, i mean that's i mean this is a quick aside that's one of the good things that you know as we get um these sort of smaller groups to embrace these older dvd projects that hopefully you know these films that were to part in the pun cut by a hatchet down yeah. you know <laughs> like you might get to see them in the original manner in which they were supposed to be seen. I mean, mm -hmm. you get to see the joke and the, you know, the punchline. <laughs> Set up and the punchline, yeah. exactly. So there's so many movies that back in the day have been that were neutered that now you can find them totally uncut. Stuff like the original Humanoids from the Deep. Our friend Frank Hennenlauter, who we've had on the podcast, his movie Brain, Brain Damage, Damage yeah. had one of the most shocking and hilarious scenes where it's kind of a, you know, it looks like it might be fellatio, but it's the monster actually yeah. going on. It's a very... Very messed up, very hilarious scene. Totally incoherent in the theatrical version. Now you can watch it on DVD from Synapse and see the full I mean, thing. Was it Nightmare on Elm Street 5? Yeah, well, there's a couple of them where, you like Friday the 13th 7, you can't find the uncut version as easily. So Nightmare on Elm Street 5 was released on VHS uncut, one of the first times, actually, because um, that VHS came out in, like, 89, 90. Mm -hmm. um, and they put out the uncut version. When it came out on DVD, for whatever reason, it's only been the rated R version. So if you want to see that uncut, you have to go find the VHS, which, sort which is of too bad. It's weird to me that, you know, the audience that would be most interested in the stuff would be the one that would want the unrated exactly. one. Exactly, and they would pay for why, that. Why would you, know? you, like, treat them like idiots? Mm -hmm. Or why would you act as an idiot? Maybe they just have dumb people at this. <laughs> We're like, oh, uh, we'll just give them that version. They'll like it, whatever. Yeah. Like, I, I and just then don't another it. one like that, even more recent, is Scream. When Scream was came out on VHS, mm -hmm. I mean, it was granted only maybe 30 seconds but within those 30 seconds you saw Drew Barrymore's boyfriend's guts, guts fall yeah. out um, which was very shocking very great effect but, um, I mean, but now on DVD all you can find is the R-rated version but that's, just, that's the, I mean you, you also gotta talk about these a lot of these stuff like brain damage and this one it sets the tone of the film you know mm. like that was sort of the the core of Scream was I would argue, based around that Drew Barrymore sequence. Everything else sort of fed off from mm -hmm. there eventually. Yeah, and that. sort of that sort of crystallized what people think of when they think of Scream. And for mm -hmm. a cut-down version of that to be the one that people remember. Yeah, that's sort of, widely available. Yeah. And something that happened in recent years with the advent of DVD is now pretty much every horror movie you see in theaters has had something cut down. But... A couple months later, you see it unrated on DVD. So I think the makers aren't they, they aren't really trying, as vocal yeah. about it. They're not really yeah. trying. They're just like, oh, you know, in theaters we had to cut out two minutes, but at least on in four months on DVD you'll see it, which is too bad because it means the fans that want to support these movies in theaters, because the only way we're going to get more movies like Let's this is it. to support them in theaters. Um, I mean, we, I, you know, they're getting not the filmmakers' intent. I they're mean, getting just a fraction of the movie. I mean, I, I think we just got first just even talk about the stigma i mean unrated is one thing but also a lot of these films were being uh given nc-17 and x ratings yeah so exactly. i mean there's such a stigma with that kind of stuff like i remember you know um it, it's granted it's not a horror film but like uh showgirls when showgirls came mm. out in the nc-17 it was like bibles needed to be thrown at people <laughs> and holy water it was well, like, and also advertising is totally cut down yeah, you like can't they, be in newspapers well, with I mean, an nc-17 rating you can't have tv just spots even think about zach and mary make a porno like they weren't even allowed to advertise that name and it was rated r and it yeah. was i mean <laughs> not even allowed to advertise that name on benches and stupid stuff like that so yeah <laughs> it, it, it makes it makes a difference and so mm -hmm. you're right that the, your, these unrated films are coming out now but it's it's it does make a difference in getting them produced when you can't release the unrated version. I know, exactly. So that's why I think, you know, even though I wasn't the biggest fan of the original Hatchet, I will be out there supporting Hatchet too, and I think all horror fans should be should as well. It, yeah. This is 
a big step. Like back in the 80s, stuff like the Evil Dead movies was able to come out unrated because, you know, it wasn't just, you know, two or three companies that owned every movie theater. It was a lot of independent theaters. Nowadays, it's more monopolized. Chain, yeah. And so it's these big chains. And if we can get unrated movies to make money at the big chains, that's what they want. They want money. That's the bottom line. I mean, it's, it's also sort of also breaking down that stigma of what like an unrated film is. Sort of there's association like unrated must mean like porno or something like that. Yeah, and which isn't it at just, all. It yeah. just means they didn't, they knew it was going to get NC-17 or something, so they didn't bring it to the ratings board. And the MPAA, if you have not familiarized yourself with it, is very erratic in what they let through and what they cut down. And so... Yeah, it's definitely that, was true. It the film called, it, there was a film about it even called This Film Was Not the, Yet Rated, yeah. which is amazing to show you what makes it through and what doesn't. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a shame. So if you can, definitely go out and support it. It, it will make a difference. Yeah. So let us know what you think of Hatchet or Hatchet 2 or this whole problem at MacGuffinPodcast.com. Mm -hmm. um, we think it's good for the films. Um, perhaps you are vehemently against unrated films being in theaters because I don't know. But yeah. let us know if you are. We'd be curious to hear your rationale behind it. All right. Stay tuned for DVD picks. Here we are once again, DVD picks of the week <laughs> for October 5th. And this being our first horror episode, it's fitting that our picks are all horror movies. Viva la horror. <laughs> so my pick for this week is another one in the long line of Shout Factory's Roger Corman cult classic line. This is the double feature of The Evil and Twice Dead. Uh, two haunted house kind of movies. One from the 70s, one from the 80s. Uh, both of them, it's the first time coming out on DVD. So, I mean, this is just continuing the Shout Factory's trend of just releasing great editions of these obscure movies. Uh, both of the movies have commentaries. They both have bonus features. Sure, things we generally like around the MacGuffin. Mm -hmm. And the price is right. I mean, what they do with these more obscure movies, they'll put them on a double feature that is the price of one of their big editions of something like Piranha, something more well-known, yeah. or like Star Crash. I appreciate that. And mm -hmm. hopefully, I mean, yeah, it's good that they pair a couple good ones together. Exactly. So what are you looking at this week, Spencer? Uh, I'm picking what is arguably the greatest horror film ever. Night of the Creeps? Uh, that's, that's true. That, that, that is in the debate. Um, the Exorcist. Oh, okay. It's coming out with a sweet Blu-ray version. First time on Blu-ray? Yep. It's got, a, I mean, it's got the director's cut and the original theatrical version. Which so. is very good, because I was not a fan of the director's cut. Yeah. No, but, I mean, I like, I like films that let you pick the version mm -hmm. you want. I don't like being told which version, which cut of a yeah. movie is the best one. I like, you know, sometimes the theatrical cut, it, cut is better. As you said, this is an example of that. So it's great that they have that. You know, they have uh, commentaries with uh, William Friedkin, uh, the the screenwriter. You know, they got they have feature the Fear of God yeah, documentary, yeah, so, which I mean, was made by the BBC at this point, nearly 15 years ago. But it's a great documentary. Yep. So they got all those interesting bits and The Exorcist. It's just is, fantastic. It's an amazing <laughs> film. If you haven't seen it, I don't know what you're doing, but yeah. you should go see it immediately. <laughs> Especially October. Yes. Come on, this, make this it. Is, this, this, this is, is the, the month. October. This that you is your watch opportunity. It. After you come see us at the Grand Illusion, <laughs> yeah. you should go do that. Um, one thing that we should mention about this Blu-ray, though, is William Friedkin is uh, kind of controversially changing the cinematography of his films in the Blu-ray releases. The French Connection has already been released, and he kind of made it look, change the filters a little bit. It looks a little pastel-y. Like, he wants all those films to have this uniform look, even if they're totally different genres, mm -hmm. like gritty cop film to horror film. So I don't know the extent of the damage that could be done to The Exorcist, but I'm kind of against that, well, especially because in that sense, I think it's on both the versions, because this was not something he did to the director's mm -hmm. cut. This is specifically to the Blu-ray. So you might be looking at something that looks well, different than what you saw in theaters in the 70s. I'm going to I'm gonna hold, cross my fingers and hope he kept it classic, because mm. amazing film. It'd be sad if he monkeyed with it like George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, that's my pick, The Exorcist. It's awesome. Check it out. Mm -hmm. And that's it for this week. Um, check us out, MacGuffinPodcast.com, where we got all sorts of awesome content going on. Yes, definitely. And uh, another reminder, our little short horror movie for this month of October is going to be playing at the Big Bear Horror Film Festival in Big Bear Lake, California. It's going to be October 16th, a Saturday, and the movie's called The Visitor in the Night. It's a nice little short suspense piece made by me and Spencer. Check it out. It's fun. And All right. We'll see you next time. Stay scared.